I don't want to say that I was worried about it because we're not to worry. But in the beginning, five weeks ago, I told you that we were going to go through the book of 2 Timothy. And today we're in verse 10, 11, and 12. For some of you, that may be a concern right now. How long will we be in 2 Timothy might be your question. Well, I just want you to know that we are going to break it up a little bit. I don't want you to get worried if you become a little stagnant in this. I hope that you don't. I hope and pray that, that God is speaking to you in a way that only he can. But I want you to know that when we think about what Paul has to say to us, it is a reminder of where we need to be grounded. It's a reminder of where, where our starting point is, that place where, where God says when, when everything else comes your way and all these other ideas come up upon you, keep the main thing the main thing. And I got to tell you, as a pastor, can I just speak to you from my heart to yours? The idea of sitting here today and thinking about a story that I want to share with you or an idea that I came up with this last week or, or a good illustration that I can't wait to share or a really stupid joke that only I laugh at and have the idea in my mind that somehow that's going to change your life, it's going to change your heart, well, it's ridiculous. The reality of it is it will only be because of what the Word of God does through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a huge thing. It is no small agenda. It is a reliance upon who God is and what only God can do. I know we just prayed, but as we begin to seek Him today, as we begin to look into His Word today, would you bow your heads with me and let's ask the Lord to just to reveal Himself in a way that only He can. Father, Lord, we are so very grateful that we can gather in a place like this today and, Lord, we get to open up the very word of God that has been spoken through man. And those words are the words that have changed the lives of, of millions of people. Not because of great speakers or great storytellers or great jokesters, but, Lord, people who speak the truth of God's word and let the word speak into the lives of people. Father, I pray this morning that beyond all the things that I want to say today, Lord, I pray that your word would be that which changes us today, not, not some idea that the pastor had, but the word of God changes us. I pray that no matter where we are today, whatever we bring with us today, whatever burden that we're carrying today, Lord, I pray that your word will oversee that. And that, Lord, that we would be conquered. And that you would be lifted high. Father, I ask it in your precious and in your wonderful name today. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, this morning, if, if I were to say the 39 articles, some of you, maybe a, a few of you in this room today, in this room today, would know what I'm referring to. Most of you wouldn't, and that would be understandable. I'm going to talk to you about these 39 articles for only one reason today, because in many ways, the way that things occurred with these 39 articles is really what Paul's saying to, to young Timothy. It's really what he's saying to you and to me today. Uh, you may remember that the church in England back in the, the late 1500s came up with this idea of these 39 articles. And these, these 39 articles were really uh, put in place to bring unity within the church in England. It was a, it was a way of saying that, that these 39 things, although there are more, there are more truths that we could add to it, but these 39 things bring unity to who we are as a church, the church of Jesus Christ. It's enough for us to be able to stand on to say these are the truths that we do not waver in. And it was a great idea and it was a great thought during that day. But something happened over time. Its purpose was to answer the question to what is the gospel. You see, that's, that's what Paul's referring to. That's what Paul's talking about. And over the period of time, things began to change. Those 39 articles written by, by these church leaders that were, that were so foundational, so, so much of truth, over a period of time, got ignored. 
And here is the re- this is not the only reason, but here's one of the reasons why that those 39 articles kind of got pushed under the rug. The idea was that over time, from those late 1500s to, you know, 100 years later, the thing that happened was is that, that people became smarter over time. This is their idea. This is not mine. But the idea was that people were smarter than the people that used to live back then. And so we have evolved. We, we, we don't need those things anymore. And, and what happened was that not just people felt that way, but there was this issue amongst the clergy of that day that began to feel the same way. And what happened was there was confusion. And then there was this idea that, that you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reach this post non-Christian people that's out there and this just isn't going to cut it. This is what their mindset was. That these, these 39 articles, it's just not going to cut it. It's not going to bring those people here. So we're going to do it a different way. We're going to try a different approach. And what they tried miserably failed because what it did was people looked and said, there's nothing relevant about the church anymore, so why even go? Well, let me now fast forward to us today. And the idea of those foundational articles that that, that we were talking about had been removed to be compromised by saying, how do we reach a a post-non-Christian community around us because this thing called the gospel, those, those specific things that we look at, they're just, that's not going to reach people anymore. Because why? Because we've lived longer and we're smarter now than those people back then. And what happened to the church? The same thing that happened to the church in the, in the 1600s. People began to leave because they found truth in their own way. They found truth in whatever the world offered. And the church became non-relevant anymore. To the degree, by the way, in case you're wondering, the average church church attender today comes to church once out of every four weeks. That's the average today. And let me just say to you this morning that that's the very thing that Paul is speaking about here. The very issue that the church in the 1600s were, were worried about, that they were, they were trying to, to make sure was clear, is what Paul was talking about when he was talking to young Timothy. And he said these words. He said, I'm going to pass this gospel on to you, and I don't want you to forsake it. Even though there are going to be those itchy ears that want to hear something else, you need to stick to the thing that really matters. And remember that the gospel is the gospel, and it never changes. And let me just say to you this morning, as I look around today and I'm watching myself, and I don't think that I see people getting smarter. I think people are the same now as they've always been. Don't discredit our forefathers and what they knew about the Word of God because it doesn't change. So Paul's talking, and he's talking about this issue, about this gospel and, and what it's about. How this gospel is supposed to be believed. How this gospel is supposed to be embraced. And how this gospel is to be proclaimed to other people. That's what Paul's talking about here. Paul says, when, when I pass on, Timothy, I'm going to give this to you. And I don't want you to, I don't want you to lose confidence in this thing. I, I don't want you to, to someday think that this thing doesn't matter anymore. And if I could just get personal with you this morning. In my heart of hearts, I believe it's the reason why you're here. Because somebody passed on the gospel to you. Somebody, somebody said to you that this gospel is important. That the meaning behind this gospel cannot be ignored. It can't be compromised. It, we have to, to remember to, to keep this, this thing that we know and pass it on to others. It's the reason why you bring your children to church. It's the reason why some of you are bringing your grandchildren to church. Because it's important. So when Paul looks and he summarizes this whole thing about the gospel, and we haven't gotten very far, I know, but last week as as we were reading verse 8, and then we didn't read verse 9 and 10, I hope that you read that on your own, even though I read it to you last week. Paul begins to summarize this thing, and he says, here it is. It always goes back to this one thing. It's grounded in the love of this eternal God. It's grounded in the love of this eternal God, who then, by the appearing of Jesus Christ, proved That everything that he said he was going to do, he did. And it is Timothy to be proclaimed to the rest of the world. That's the gospel message. Don't let it go. And I think it's so very important that we don't lose sight, that we don't compromise 
in this message that Paul's given. It's important that we are clear about these things. It's clear that you and I know how to convey this message to our kids, to those around us. Now you say, Pastor, we know what the gospel is. We're not stupid. I mean, we're smart people, and you are. But can I just say to you this morning, without being critical of any of you or, or of myself even, because I think I catch myself from time to time catching myself in this trap of somehow wanting to reach people, but, but I don't want to press, just, just throw the cross at them or, or throw the blood at them, so we do different things. And those things that we sometimes do, it's not really the gospel. So can I give you some examples this morning of things that I think that we do all the time? Things that I think that if we're going to talk about what the gospel is, it doesn't involve these things. I mean, it might be a part of our experience, but it's not the gospel. You want to write these things down, you can't, or just try to remember them in your mind. But I dare to say that as I say some of these things, you're going to say, yeah, that's me. I've done that. I've tried that. That was my approach. Look at this with me this morning. Here's what it does not involve, okay? Listen to these thoughts this morning. When people come up to you and say, hey, let me tell you what's going to happen at the end of time. <laughs> well, okay, it's true. There's some things that are going to happen at the end of time. But that's not the gospel in itself. What we're doing is we're trying to tell people, listen, there's going to come a time that this thing's over and you better get it. Well, it's not the gospel. It's, it's, it's truth, but it's not the gospel. Or if we tell people, Jesus lives in my heart. We well, are telling people that something that, that they can't even begin to comprehend. Okay, well, you got Jesus in your heart. People got all different kinds of things in their heart. But is that the gospel? It's, that, that doesn't explain the gospel. It's, it's a part of our experience. Don't, don't, don't email me this week and say, Pastor, how dare you talk about it? It's wrong to tell people that Jesus is in my heart. No, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying if you're trying to explain to people what the gospel is, that's not it. Or I like this one because I think then we go from one extreme to the other. You know, it, it's bad if you don't accept Jesus Christ. I mean, it's either Jesus or it's the other thing. And, and to a degree, that's true, and I, I completely agree with that. But that's not really the message of the gospel. It's the, it's, the, it's the response that we have at the end, but it's not the gospel. Oh, here's one for you. Joel Olstein loves this one. You know, you, you come to Jesus Christ, and man, every day's a Friday after that for you. You come to Jesus Christ, and, and everything you want, you're going to get because Jesus loves you. It's good for you. Well, let me just say that, that there's good things that God gives us. But if it's prosperity gospel, no, that's not gospel at all. See, all these things, at the end of the day, still doesn't answer the question, what's the gospel? It's, it's part of the experience, but that's not it. Because if you're looking at chapter two, uh, chapter one, and you look at verses eight, nine, and 10, he gives us clarity about what the gospel is. And let me just kind of tell you, you can write these things down if you want, but it's simply this. The gospel involves sin and grace and faith and repentance. Let me just say that to you again if you're writing those things down. The gospel is about sin, it's about grace, it's about faith, and it's about repentance. And that all is grounded in the love of God. It's, it's, it's not that we do bad things. And some people say, well, I, I, I'm not a sinner. I mean, I'm, I might do bad things on occasionally, but I'm not a sinner. And the, the reality of it is, that's what it's all about. There's a condition that you have. There's a condition that I have that can't be resolved because I choose to do good. It's because I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And, and, the, and at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is, is that would you just turn to your neighbor real quick and look at them and say, you got a problem. You're going to love that. Say it. It feels good. Say it again. You have a problem. But here's the good news. Say this to your neighbor. God has a solution. Folks, at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. The gospel is this. You have a problem, and the good news is, is that God has a solution. And your problem is sin. And here's, here's the reality, and I'm going to stop right here because that's my introduction. I've carried this water bucket a long way now. For the last five weeks, you've heard me talk about this gospel, this thing called the gospel over and over and over again. And you're wondering, Pastor, are we ever going to walk away from the gospel? <laughs> Two things, no, one, well, we're not. And number two, 
There's more to be said about it. Believe it or not, there's more to be said about this issue of the gospel. But do you not see, do you not see that over the last five weeks that we spent a great deal of time just listening to what it is that Paul has to say about this issue of the gospel? So why would the Holy Spirit be so, be so determined to spend so much time to speak through Paul to Timothy about this issue of the gospel if it wasn't so important? And there wasn't so much more to know other than just it's good news. There's more to it than that. Because here at the end of the day, Paul is so clear about this message, and now he's going to be clear about something else. He's not just clear about the message, but now he's going to be very clear about the messenger. So if you have your Bible this morning, I'd like to ask that you would turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I hope that you read 8, 9, and 10, and that at least you spent some time looking at it, because that's what that whole thing was about. It was about a loving God who throughout eternity loved you so much that through the Son, Jesus Christ, he appeared and showed everything that he said he would do, he did. So that you could understand that you have a problem and God is the solution. So if you have your Bibles this morning, he now talks about this issue about the clarity of the messenger. And that's who Paul is. He's the messenger. And this is what he says. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. He says, and of this gospel... I was appointed a herald. And some of you say, what in the world is that? It's a preacher. It's a messenger. He says, I was appointed a herald or a preacher or a messenger. And, he says, an apostle and a teacher. So Paul makes it clear that he, that God has made him a herald or a messenger of this thing that we call the gospel. It wasn't appointed to him by some friends. It was not something that the church appointed him to be. It was something that God appointed him to be. And I think this morning it would be very important that you understand that Paul has been set apart to do the thing that God has called him to do. And this morning I think there's confusion. And you say, Pastor, that's all you've been talking about. There's confusion about what the gospel is. There's confusion about what the messenger is. But I think there's confusion about these three things, the apostle, the teacher, and the preacher. For a few minutes today, I want to talk to you about what those three things are. I know in the beginning when we started this series, I talked to you about what it meant to be an apostle. But I want to walk through this again to explain what are these differences between an apostle and a teacher and a preacher. If you look at the word apostle, and you can just write this down in your notes. This is something you probably should write down. An apostle is simply this. is that for Paul, he shared in the responsibilities with all the other apostles. Now, now, as an apostle, he shares these responsibilities and, and their idea was about two things. It was about formulating what has happened, understanding what has taken place, because everybody's confused. What did Jesus do? Why did he do it? What does that mean for us? It, these apostles formulated what the message was through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then the second part was to proclaim it to everybody else. That was, the, that was the responsibility of the apostle. And they say, Pastor, you're saying that, but what, is, what does Jesus have to say about it? Well, Jesus says this. He says, when I leave, you remember this. You remember Jesus saying this. Jesus says, when I leave, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to invade your life. He's going to do a work in you that you have never experienced before. And then here's the good news. What you don't know he will make known to you. What you don't know, he will make known to you. And then when you understand, then you will convey that message to those around you, to others. So the apostles had a responsibility to formulate these things so that this gospel message would be sent out to everyone else to provide a historical understanding of what just occurred in historical events. What took place? Why did it happen? And then the interpretation of that event. What now do we do with it? What happens after this? And I want to make sure that we don't miss this. Because here's where the confusion comes from this issue of what an apostle is. It's by the means of the New Testament that the apostle's doctrine is being passed on to you and to me. It's by the means of the New Testament. It's not the New Testament plus the teachings of the church. The message, the gospel message, is always and always will be about what took place. Solely by the New Testament and by the help of the Old Testament that proclaimed what was going to happen with Jesus. 
It is not something that is added to. See, the role of the, the apostle, where I think we get confused sometimes, is this. When we think about the authority, we go wrong when we start thinking, okay, we think, we think of the apostles as a, as a personality. That each, each apostle had a personality, and each apostle wrote by the means of, of who they were and the way that they interpreted it. And to a certain degree, don't misunderstand me, that's true. But each of the apostles had one thing that was very, very clear. There was a work of the Holy Spirit that was speaking through them, using their character, using their personality to give truth to what the gospel message is all about. And, and you say, well, Pastor, wouldn't that entail a lot of people? I mean, you're not talking about just some, right? You're, you're talking about there's others too. Uh, let me say to you that being an apostle is not something that is repeated. It's not a repeated thing. Some of you are saying right now, but wait a minute, pastor. I went to a church, and, and the pastor of that church, he said he was an apostle. Well, I just don't mean to be critical, and please don't take it the wrong way, but he was wrong. He's not an apostle. I, I guess sometimes if you think, well, if I want to have a title, there's, there's pastor, apostle. That sounds a lot better. It sounds more authoritative, doesn't it? So I think I'll just use the word apostle. But the reality of it is, there, it was, apostles were a one-time thing. It's not a repeatable thing. There were 12 apostles, and that was it. There was no more after that. So if there's confusion about titles, and I'm sure that the idea was they were just trying to give themselves a title like pastor, and they were confused by the meaning of it too. But apostles are not something that are repeated. In fact, let me just share with you that there are three criteria, at least three, of what apostles were. And I think that this will make even more sense to you. And this is what I talked to you about early on when we started this series together. I think I gave this to you. There are three. Here's the first. The, an apostle had to be a person who had seen the risen Christ. That's a very select number of people. That same person who had seen the risen Christ, number two, had received a divine commission from that risen Christ. And then number three, they taught and wrote under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. It is why it is not a repeated thing. There was an apostle, and they, here's what they did, folks. They worked themselves out of a job. The idea of their job was, as an apostle, was to formulate what had happened and then communicate that to everybody else. And once that was done, there was no new revelation that was needed. Because the message, the point of it all, was to give the gospel to the world so that they would know. It's, you said, wait a minute, Pastor, didn't you just start talking about 39 articles a minute ago? And how does that apply? Well, let me explain that to you real quickly. You should never follow the 39 articles if those 39 articles don't point back to what the, the, the Scripture says. But the reality of it is those 39 articles matched up very well with Scripture and to the point where it was straight from the Word of God. That's how you choose to follow that. It's not that you only look at 39 articles and say that's inspired Word of God. No, the 39 articles need to come from the inspired Word of God. So that's an apostle. Let's talk about the other. Now you said, Pastor, that's the first. But isn't the preacher the first one in there? Yeah, I know, but since I'm preaching, I decided to say apostle first, just in case you're wondering. The second is this. It's the preacher or the messenger. Now a preacher, again, I think gives great confusion to people in what they are. Some people think about a preacher as being less than a teacher. Now these are not my words, but I read this and I thought that really does, that really does apply. Let me explain what that means. I don't think that you can really preach if you don't teach. I don't think you can preach if you don't teach. You have to teach also in order to preach. Now, I grew up, my family grew up in the South. Many of you know that I've shared that many, many times. And I remember my grandma, when I was a very young boy, talking about the preachers back where she grew up. And I remember her talking about, you know, she'd say, she'd, with, her, with her very strong Southern accent, she would say, boy, he really got up and preached this morning. He really started preaching. And they think, what in the world did she mean by that? That he got preaching. He was, what we think about when we say that is, is that, you know, he got up. He got excited. He got in your face. He started preaching. He, start, he started getting on it. But see, here's the thing. To be a teacher, this idea uh, that people have about a preacher is this, it's almost like this, this hot air balloon. It's just like he gets up and he starts just going at it. He just starts going at it. But you need to understand that, that preaching... 
is teaching plus application. When a preacher gets up and he preaches, he's a herald. He's, he, is, he is announcing the gospel, the good news. And he's appealing to all those in their, in their minds and in their hearts and in their will about what they're supposed to do in their life. Uh, we're going to go into this deeper, but let me just give you an example. I was talking to a guy, and, he, and, and we got on the subject. He knew I was a pastor. He says, hey, pastor, you know what? I go to church too. And, and, I, and I, I'd seen him a little bit. I'd worked with him for a while. I noticed that there were a lot of things that didn't quite match up in his life, the way that he talked. But he went to church every Sunday. He said, pastor, I go to church every Sunday. Let me tell you, I know the Lord. And I said, do they preach the word of God at your church? He said, oh, yeah, our preacher, man, he really knows how to preach. I said, well, let me tell you, if your preacher is preaching from the word of God, then let me say this, something to you. That what he's preaching needs to affect your mind. And it needs to affect your heart. And it needs to affect the will of your life and how you live out your life. You can't just go and say, man, I heard that preaching. That was enough for me. Folks, it has to do something to you. The word of God has that kind of effect on you and me. And, and if you don't have that, then you know all you've done. You just went to church. That's it. So he's appealing to those people. And, and in fact, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. He says this. He says, we implore you. <laughs> I mean, do you feel the urgency of what Paul is saying there? He says, I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. He doesn't say this thing like, okay, now here's, here's some information, and I want you to go and, and consider it. <laughs> He's not saying, hey, here's some stuff to think about. Hey, give it a shot. Tell me what you think later. If it applies to you, great. If it doesn't, let it go. No, that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I implore you by Christ Jesus to be reconciled to God. So the gospel message, if it's being preached in the church, is something that God wants to be a change of heart and change of mind and a change of our wills too. It needs to make you a different person. Why? Why? Because it's not just that you're doing bad things. Because you are what I am. You're a sinner. That's the problem. And God has the solution. Now, I'm not done talking about preacher yet because there's a whole lot more to that. But hold on for just a moment. Let me talk to you a little bit about a teacher for just a second. The third is a teacher. And we said, wow, pastor. I mean, you got preachers, you got teachers, you got apostles. It's getting confusing already. But let me, let me hold on to that for just a moment. You'll understand what I'm saying in just a second. A teacher is someone who are to, to, are to supply us with understanding about things. Uh, the understanding about uh, why we do what we do. Let, let me give you an understanding of what we're talking about here. We talk about this thing, for example, what we've been talking about, this issue of the gospel. What's the gospel? What does a teacher do? He goes behind and he says who Jesus is. He talks about what Jesus has done. And then he tells the listener what they must believe to be saved. And so, for example, we talk about what does this thing about salvation mean then, Pastor? Well, he goes back, the teacher goes back and explains, hey, it's the love of God. It's the love of God of all eternity. Then he, and he sees those who are sinless, who are sinful. And by his grace, by the instrument of faith, by the, by the place of repentance, we believe See, I can stand up and say to you, we need Jesus in our lives. I can say, you need Jesus in your life because of the sin in your life. And, and I ask you to raise your hand or I ask you to say a prayer or I ask you to come to the altar and pray. And you do it. But let me explain something to you about preaching real quick and then I want to come back to this teaching thing. Preaching, when it is done at its best, gives us four things. And you don't have to write these things down unless you want to. Preaching does four things if it's done well. Instruction, it tells you what you do. It gives you illustrations of why that, what happens. It gives you an explanation of why you do it. And then it gives you application. Teachers come behind and, and, and go, come behind the preacher and explain to the people who just gave their heart to Christ what they're supposed to do next. What what did it mean, what, they just, what occurred in their life? Can I give you an example real quick? In my life, growing up, there was a man by the name of Billy Graham. Anybody ever heard that name before? Okay. He filled stadiums full of people. And at the end, he did, all he did, he shared the good news of who Jesus was. 
And then he said to people, if you want Jesus, if you want the Jesus that I've told you about, I want you to come forward and I want you to give your life to him. And so you know what people did? They came forward and they gave their hearts to him. Now, some people are very critical about Billy Graham. Some people say, you know what, Billy Graham, he filled great stadiums full of people and people got saved. But you know what, Billy Graham, he didn't take them that next step. Well, let me explain something to you. Billy Graham was a preacher. Billy, Billy Graham shared the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the responsibility of the teacher to come behind that and say, now, here's the reason why you raised your hand. Here's the reason why you prayed the prayer. Here's the reason why you came forward. And I think at the end of the day, if I'm being truthful, I think that, that we need to look for preachers and we need to look for teachers. I think the two go hand in hand. And I just want to say to you this morning, we don't have to look for apostles anymore because that's done. Everything that we needed, everything that, that God wanted for us, we have right now. There is no, there's going to be no new revelation for your life. Let me just say that to you right now. There's nothing new that God is going to do except come back. Everything that you need has been given to us. So Paul says you need to understand there's a difference between an apostle. There's a difference between a pastor or a preacher and a teacher. And I think that the best culmination of it all is a person who is a preacher and a teacher. Well, then Paul goes on to talk about his suffering. So I've talked about what the messenger for just a moment, what that messenger is, and he proclaims himself to be a messenger by God, from God. So then Paul talks about his suffering. I want you to look at your Bibles with me real quick. Look at verse 12. This is what he says. He says, that is why I am suffering. You know, he just said, I'm a messenger. I'm, I'm an apostle. I'm, I'm a herald. And, and, and I'm a teacher. And then in verse 12, he says, and oh, by the way, because I am a messenger of that gospel, that is why I'm suffering as I am. <laughs> you get it? There's a reason why Paul is suffering. He says, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So you might say now to yourself, what did you say, pastor? Why is Paul suffering? Here it is. Can you listen very carefully to me this morning? It's because of the gospel. Paul says, you want to know why I'm in prison? You know why I'm suffering the way that I am? It's because of the gospel message that I am here today. And here's the deal. Back then, they didn't like it. <laughs> you, know why, you know why Paul was in prison? Because people did not like the message of the gospel. You know what's sad? It is the very same reason today people don't like the gospel today. Do you know why people don't like the gospel today? Let me give you at least one reason why. Because here's the kicker. Because it's free. It's a gift. It's not because of anything that you can do on your own. And I don't know what it is, but there are a lot of people who they just don't feel good about giving themselves a gift. They don't go out and buy themselves a gift. So receiving a gift from God seems very odd. It feels like there's got to be conditions with it. There's got to be a reason why somebody's giving me something free. I've got to do something on the back end of it. Well, let me explain something to you this morning about that real quick before we go any further. Because see, the gospel story is a gift. It is not anything that we've done to earn it. In fact, let me tell you what about Saul before he was Paul. If there was anybody who said, you know, if I'm going to do anything in my life to get to what I want, it was him because he worked hard at it. He, he wasn't trying to receive something that God had for him. He was working toward it. He went to school. He wanted to understand what the Bible said. He wanted to become what the, a person was supposed to be. He had the right last name. He had the right teaching. He had the right background. He did all the things. All, you see what I'm saying? I, I, I. This is what Paul, this is what Saul was doing. And then Paul learned a very valuable lesson. It had nothing to do with what he did. It was a gift from God. Amen. Nothing else. And we struggle with that. The gospel story is a gift and you don't do anything to earn it. You don't buy yourself a gift. It is freely given to you. And let me just say something to you about something being free. It's a death blow, is it not, to human pride? <laughs> it's just a blow to human pride. Because here's the deal, by our nature, by your nature and by my nature, 
we are not worthy of God. We can't walk into his presence because of who God is. You know that makes it everything else so clear. Because the only way we can is because he gives us this gift. By his grace, he gives us this gift. We can't fix our condition. That's the horrible part about it. We sit around all of our lives and we try to figure out, how do I stop cussing? How do I stop looking at people the wrong way? How, why do I have this anger problem? I'm going to fix it, fix it, fix it, and fix it. And we try our entire lives. And at the end of the day, there's only one reason why we can have that. Because of the gift of God. And folks, we don't like it. So what do you do? What do you do if you don't like it? You got to understand the only thing you can do is to remember that it is by God's grace, by nothing else. So you want to know how you don't suffer? So, so Paul says, the reason why I'm suffering, the reason why I'm in prison is because of that gospel message. So if you're a pastor or you're a teacher or any other title that you give yourself, you know how you don't have to suffer? You know how you don't have to worry about suffering later on in your life? Here's how. Just mute our words. Stop speaking about the cross. Take the cross out of the situation. Take the gospel out of the situation. If you want to you get together and have kumbaya and do all those things that just make us feel really good, then stop speaking about the gospel. Here's what you could do instead. You just, you just leave it out. You just tell people, you know, you stand up on Sunday morning, you tell people, Man, I just want to stand before you today and I just want to tell you how wonderful you are. I want to tell you how great you are. I want to tell you that man, when you leave here, I look at you and I say, man, you are on a mountaintop and drink a Coca-Cola and have a great rest of your day. That's it. If I don't want to worry about suffering for the gospel, then leave the gospel message out. Don't talk about the cross. Leave that stuff out. Show it on their merits and their merits alone, and that's all you have to do. And leave the gospel message out of it. Because the alternative is, if you're willing, people need to know that they need Jesus and that they're a mess and they can't get out of that mess without the power of who Jesus is. And that, folks, can I say to you this morning, that, folks, is the gospel message. It's not to just tell you how bad you are. We already know deep down inside that we are sinful people. But the good news is, is that God's grace for you and for me was so wonderful that by the giving of his son, that through our faith and trust in that, we can have new life and we can have it abundantly and the promises of God will be for us and some will happen now, but most will happen later. Because even as Paul is in prison, he's about to have his head taken off, but he's about to also to receive a crown in heaven, which seems kind of strange and odd all at the same time. And all I know, folks, is this. Is that what he says here, he says, I am suffering, yet there is no cause for shame. Because as I preach this gospel, I know that it is because of the gospel and the gospel alone that lives are changed. Nothing else. But I'm not ashamed. And by the way, he knows. And look at this with me. That is why I'm suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. He knows in what he believes in and that is in the man of Jesus Christ. I've got a story for you. If you have your hymnal, would you grab one real quick? And I want to sing a hymn to you. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> The man's name is Daniel Whittle. The hymn that you sang this morning, entitled, I Know Whom I Have Believed, page 409, was a man who served in the Civil War. He was severely injured. And I believe if I remember the story correctly, his arm was taken off. So while he's recovering... He needs something to keep his time occupied. And he looks around and he finds this Bible. And he picks it up and he begins to read it. I love this story. He picks it up and he begins to read it. And an orderly comes to him and she assumes that because he's reading the Bible that he's a believer. 
But she comes to him and she says, excuse me, sir, but would you mind praying with this man who's laying over here on this cot because he's about to die? <laughs> and Whittle is thinking, uh, what do I do? He's barely a believer himself. In fact, he's just searching himself. He doesn't know Jesus any more than that man who's dying over there on that cot. And so you know what he did? Let me tell you what he did. By the grace of God, he knew, folks, he knew by what he read that this thing was a gift from God. And so he prayed for himself first. And then he went over and he got down on his knees and he began to pray with this man who was dying. And before he got up, he looked at the man who was on the cot. He says, this is what I'm certain of, that one day I will see you again. We will both be together in heaven and it will be only because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and for me. Amen. That's a wonderful story in itself. But then that same man, Daniel Whittle, wrote this song, I Know Whom I Believe. In page 409, I'm going to read to you just the first four verses and then I want you to listen to very carefully how this passage in 2 Timothy was so profound to, to Daniel Whittle. And it says this, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath been made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair or if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He picked up the gospel. He read the gospel, and there was a lot of questions of why. He didn't know the answers to, but he knew enough to know that it was all because of that, all because of the message of Jesus Christ, that he would see that man again one day. Folks, let me tell you, that's what the gospel message is all about. It's why we're here today. It's the reason why you, you tolerate the stories, the application, the, the stupid jokes that you only laugh at to make me feel better about me. But it is the message. It is the gospel message that changes everything. For a man who did not understand why God's love would be so great that he would come and send his son, he didn't know why. But the message was preached to him the message was taught to him, and he was forever changed because of that.